Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Endoscopic skull base surgery. Now let me try to explain that because it's our topic today. An endoscope is a slender tube-shaped instrument, like a small telescope with a light on it that's used to look inside the body cavity or an organ. And I think one of our guests has one. It, do you have that endoscope? Yeah. Hold we that do. up so yeah. we can see. Okay, oh, yeah, it's pretty small. <laughs> pretty small. <laughs> so a medical or a surgical procedure any of any type that uses an endoscope is called an endoscopy. Are you with me so far? So far. All right, now the skull base, it is the part of the skull that supports the brain and it separates the brain from the rest of the head it actually only takes up the upper part the brain only takes up the upper part of the head and the blood vessels that go from the heart up to the brain and the nerves that come out of the brain uh, they go through little holes in the skull base this is starting to make me nervous uh, putting it all together well (laughs) hopefully you never need whatever we're going to talk about putting it all together surgeons are using small tubes small telescopes with lights on them to operate on tumors in and around the base of the skull. Now, that takes some precision and some skill. Absolutely, and you don't want just anyone doing that if you are the patient. <laughs> you got that right. Joining us in studio to tell us more about endoscopic skull base surgery are Mayo Clinic neurosurgeon, Dr. Jamie Von Gompel, and ear, nose, and throat surgeon, Dr. Garrett Choby. Welcome both of you to the studio. Thanks for having us. Good to have you, gentlemen. So there must be a reason there are two of you here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, these surgeries are as complicated as you were suggesting, and they just uh, can't be done with one person, I think. And yeah. who does what? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, we uh, do a lot of things together. Uh, I sort of get Dr. Van Gumpel through the nose to the area of the tumor. Then we work uh, hand in hand to address and resect the tumor. We also work hand in hand to close any defect or hole that we may have created during the surgery. So when you say through the nose, is it through the nostril or do you actually lift the nose up and get in there? Yeah, great great question. The nose is actually a lot bigger than you think. Uh, So the nose that we think of in the front of the face is very, a very small part of the nose. We do access everything through the nostrils, so no external incisions for these surgeries. And we open up the sinuses that uh, line the, in, in the nasal cavity, if you will, and really sit up against the skull base. We use those sinuses as a corridor to get to these tumors. I kind of wish I would have called in sick today. <laughs> and how far, how far back in do you go to get to where you need to be? You know, it depends on what we're treating. You know, sometimes we're treating something just behind the eyes or just around the eyes. Sometimes we're going as, as much as 12 or, or 14 centimeters into the head when we go down to the odontoid or the bottom part of the skull base. So that's like five or six inches. But yeah. Yeah. What, so how did you used to do this operation before you had these little scopes? Well, you know, sometimes we made incisions elsewhere on the head and, and, and you know, took some skull off and then pushed the brain out of the way. Or alternatively, some of the approaches were done by actually taking part of the face off. And these approaches allow us to mitigate a lot of the problems that we saw with those types of uh, procedures that they did back in the 80s and early 90s. What kind of, what are you trying to get at? I'm assuming tumors, but what are you looking for? So we treat a variety of different things. Um, So we treat things that aren't tumors sometimes, like spontaneous CSF leaks together, um, benign pituitary. Spontaneous CFS leaks, explain that to us. So sometimes uh, the skull base just gives up and doesn't keep the fluid inside the head. And, uh, we, so there's fluid around the brain mm-hmm. and around the spinal cord, and it, and it leaks sometimes? Yeah, and it's, it's supposed to be around the brain. It's, it kind of acts as a natural buffer for the brain, and just once in a while the, 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 uh, the bone breaks down and the, the covering around the brain breaks down, and you can't have that leaking into the nose because that could lead to infections. So we treat a lot of those types of things together. Leaks. Mm-hmm. Oh, leaks. Yeah. so yeah. cerebral spinal fluid leak. That, so, and how does someone present with that? Is it something that's coming out of their nose? And you figure out, ooh, this is cerebral spinal fluid? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, so most patients with the problem present with leakage of clear fluid out of one nostril, almost like a faucet. Wow. And uh, classically, it's related to a disease of elevated intracranial pressure, which can over time thin the bone of the skull base. And eventually, as Dr. Van Gumpel mentioned, uh, the bone around the, the skull base and the dura or the lining around the brain can give way and then they spring a leak in the nose. All right, what else do you work on in there? So a lot of tumors, most of them are benign tumors like pituitary tumors, uh, craniopharyngiomas, uh, but also some tumors that can be cancerous like chordomas. 
And, uh, Cytonism malignancies as well. Craniopharyngioma. Tell us what that is. That a, <laughs> is that benign? Sounds like it. So it's a tumor that doesn't go elsewhere in the body, but it grows uh, locally. It can cause some problems. It's a, it's, a, it's a developmental rest that grows into a tumor over time. And they can be really challenging mm-hmm. tumors to treat, quite honestly. And tell us how you prepare to do this and how you discover what the lesion is and where it is. So most of these uh, come to it, we're, so we're obviously at a, at a quaternary care facility. Most of these are recognized elsewhere, but a lot of the patients come in either with problems with their pituitary gland, headaches, or alternatively vision problems. And once those are discovered and worked up by another doctor, they come in oftentimes with an MRI, and uh, we don't have to do an awful lot of diagnostic workup. But then they meet with both of us, and sometimes other uh, doctors, because mm-hmm. these lesions are that complicated, that we need input from a variety of people. And then we put together a surgical plan and, and, uh, and execute it to the best of our abilities. Yeah. And once you're in there, I understand that you can actually use a CT scan in the operating room or get an MRI in the operating room to help you further visualize and, and determine exact location? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great process that we have. We have the ability to use intraoperative navigation. So use a patient's uh, very own CT scan or MRI scan we can register it with their own body in the operating room and then use a probe, if you will, that will show us where we are in their head or the skull base in direct correlation to their CT scan. So it's sort of real life anatomic visualization in both the patient as well as their radiographic study. Most commonly we use CT scans, but MRI scans are also possible. And most of these lesions, do you suck them out with that instrument <laughs> or how do you get them out? Yeah, thank God. That most of them are <laughs> suckable. Um, you know, that, that, that does help a lot of these procedures because they can be removed. And, I, and I'm assuming that you've seen cordomas in the past. Um, Not most, in that location, but yeah, yeah, they, they can occur anywhere, practically. But, but uh, most, the most of them are, are suckable lesions, mm-hmm. but not all of them. In fact, we've run across some very difficult ones that are firm, fibrous, very bloody. And realistically, those are the ones that really test a team like yeah. ours' abilities and uh, really take a lot of thought and, and forethought into the procedure. Well, this certainly is better than having to cut off part of the face to access where you're at. So <laughs> I'm not a medical person, but I can at least get that that makes a lot of sense. But what are complications that might come up using this type of care? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. We, we have to work, you know, obviously very carefully in these areas. And Dr. Van Gumpel and I are big believers in uh, a co-pilot technique, if you will. So it's not simply that we both have complementary skill sets surgically, but it's really our two minds working together, if you will. So thinking about problems and addressing them and sort of bouncing ideas off of one another. So in these anatomic regions, the most common things that can arise as a complication of surgery are damage to very important arteries that live nearby or cranial nerves, nerves that control much of the function in the head and neck region. Uh, most commonly in this particular region, it may be things related to vision, but certainly other deficits can occur as well. All right, so you got four hands and you got two brains. It's uh, <laughs> the epitome of the team approach at the Mayo Clinic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it really is. Endoscopic skull base surgery using lighted scopes to remove tumors in a very difficult location.
a team of Mayo Clinic surgeons using highly sophisticated techniques to prove to provide the best care possible. Our thanks to Mayo Clinic neurosurgeon Dr. Jamie Von Gombel and ENT surgeon Dr. Garrett Choby. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank thanks you. for being here, guys.